All right, welcome everyone. So it's my great pleasure to introduce you to uh, the RUM session of the Comstock Video Seminar. Um, I'm going to explain very briefly how we do this for those of you uh, who may be new. So um, RUM session means that we're going to have eight speakers, eight very short talks, so five minutes per person, and then a couple of minutes or so for questions afterwards. And uh, these five minutes, they will really be strictly enforced by me, and that will be um, the nice part, one of the many nice parts of my job here uh, to be able to do that. So uh, it's going to be very interesting, I think. It's always very interesting when we do this kind of thing. So we have five minutes per person. Um, if you have a question uh, for people, uh, the, our normal system is that you, uh, during the talk already, we kind of accumulate questions. So you start typing them into the chat and uh, you do it a bit like this. So you put the word question in all uppercase followed by your question. And then I know there will be at least one question that would be always very nice to know. And maybe there will be more. Uh, of course, five minutes is very short. So maybe you will not manage to um, listen to part of the talk, think of a question and type it in all in before the five minutes are over. That's also OK. You can also type into the chat something like, I have a question. And then uh, I will be able to call on you and you will be uh, able to ask the question through the microphone. Also, um, you can ask the question uh, during the question period. You can raise your hand. So maybe some of the people who know how to raise their hand can demonstrate how it works. You go to the reactions menu at the bottom and you press, I raise my hand and look at several people who figured it out. Uh, and then I will also know that you would like to say something and I can, I can ask you uh, to speak. So now lower your hand again, uh -huh. unless you actually have a question right now. Um, then, um, during uh, in the middle of the session we're going to have a break after talk number four the usual breaks in the breakout rooms so there we have 10 minutes i will uh, put you in random breakout rooms you can accept the invitation or you can decline it as you wish and then you're going to be put into a room with um, usually it's like a handful of people who show up and you can uh, have a virtual simulation of the coffee break experience of uh, an actual conference and um, most of the time that's uh, very nice Obviously, it can also go wrong, but I think it doesn't happen too often. Um, and afterwards, uh, we're going to try for the second time this thing of those who want to, to meet on uh, Gather Town, this online thing. I will put at the very end the link into the chat. Um, and that's the, the Gather Town space that Reshef has created for the Comstock workshop that will take place in June and that he wants people to try. And then you can go there and you can try it and you can, for example, speak again a bit more to the speakers of today because there will not be enough time probably to ask them everything you want to ask them. Uh, and you can also talk to other people. We are right now still using the free version so there can only 25 people at the same time go to that. There was no problem last time, uh, but just in case uh, you will not get admitted to that thing this time, I'm, I'm sorry about that, but that's because we are still trying how useful it is and whether somebody should find some money for that. Um, okay, then I think we can basically uh, get started. So, um, Yorgos, you can share your screen and then I will start. Yes, so our first yeah. speaker is uh, Yorgos and um, the floor is yours. Great. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Yorgos, and for the next five minutes, I'm going to talk to you about the work we did together with my PhD advisor at Athens University of Economics and Business, Vagilis Markakis, about efficient winner determination and strategic control in elections under conditional approval voting rule. And oh, that was uh, quite an unexpected appearance from you, Homer, but that is exactly what I was expecting from the audience to take home uh, after the talk. Um, have in mind that, in general, enhancing voters' expressiveness comes at a high computational cost. In my presentation, I'll try to give you some evidence about the existence of a voting method that is highly expressive, computationally efficient, and resistant to certain control actions. Yeah, sure. Uh, so let's consider two friends who need to decide on a common meal. They have five different food options, and they would like to use a voting rule to select a subset of them to share. Suppose that the preferences of the first voter can be easily expressed using simple approval ballots. 
but considering the second voter, even if he feels totally confident about voting in favor of a beer, his preferences on the rest of the alternatives are a bit more complex. Specifically, he is okay either with or without the donut and the chocolate. He could accept the can of crab meat only if both donut and chocolate are also included in the winning set. And his opinion about burgers is strongly related on whether beer will be selected or not. It's obvious that in such settings, voting separately for each issue using simple approval ballots cannot provide a good solution. So in fact, the voters are willing to use a generalization of approval voting, which should be way more expressive. And uh, my is absolutely right, since conditional approval voting, as defined by Barrow and Lang, could absolutely solve the decision-making problem. Yes, definitely. So in the model studied, uh, each voter is expressing some dependency between the issues by providing such a graph called dependency graph. And modifying a bit our initial example, consider a scenario in which we only care about the beer, the donut, and the chocolate alternatives. The first voter is willing to express an opinion about the chocolate condition on the donut's outcome, which in turn is conditioned on the outcome concerning the beer. For the rest of voters, their opinions about chocolate are conditioned on uh, both the outcomes of the other two issues. And additionally, we define the global dependency graph as the union of the voters' dependency graphs, which, according to Bart, uh, plays a crucial role in our results. Uh, to what concerns voters' ballots, we simply ask for such a table, which indicates uh, their preferences. Um, I think I will not give any more details about its formation due to time constraints. And for the time being, just believe me that for every voter, it's possible to compute exactly the number of issues that dissatisfy him, uh, given a specific outcome. And we can use conditional mean sum voting rule in order to minimize the sum of voters' dissatisfaction, under which we are obliged to share the voters of our example, a beer, a donut, but not a chocolate. And all things were great up to this point, but unfortunately, although classical mean sum approval voting is polynomial computable, when allowing conditional votes, the problem becomes MP hard. Uh, and that's even when each issue is binary and conditioned on at most uh, one other in every voter's dependency graph. So let's dive into the computational problems that we examined and briefly refer to our results. First of all, we studied the case where every issue is dependent on at most one other. In such instances, we say that the maximum mean degree um, of every vertex in the dependency graph of every voter uh, equals one which is the first step generalization of uh, simple approval, uh, mean sum approval voting. And we proved that for such instances, optimally determining uh, the winner can be done in polynomial time. Uh, in, in the case of that the tree width of the global dependency graph uh, is bounded. After that, it is natural to question about what happens if we are given an instance with a global dependency graph of non-constant tree width. And interestingly, we proved that it is unlikely that this problem uh, could be optimally solved in polynomial time, which proves that tree width is essentially the only parameter that leads to optimality. And furthermore, we proved that our algorithm is almost the best possible uh, in terms of running time. And finally, if, uh, if and only if both the tree width and the domain of its issue are constants, then the problem can be placed in the FPT complexity class. Let me also quickly refer to some approximate results. Uh, for the case of binary issues, uh, using a reduction to the mean to solve problem, we proved that the 2.2 approximation algorithm exists, which in fact can be generalized. And finally, uh, we provide an almost complete, complete picture concerning the computational aspects of controlling either a single or every outcome of the election by adding or deleting voters or alternatives. And I think that I just reached the end of the presentation. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. It was excellent and perfectly in time. So let's all uh, unmute ourselves um, for a round of applause. For a round of applause. All right. Um, then I see one question in the chat already. If there are more people, please uh, type fast. And it was Christoph, and he wanted to know what the DOM parameter is about, which I'm sure he has better eyes than me. So he must have seen that somewhere on your slide. Yes, it's the domain of, uh, of every issue. Um, and it has to do with the, if it is uh, possible to place the problem in the FPT complexity class. This is oh, yes. purple one. 
Yes, to have an FPT algorithm, we have to bound both the domain of every issue and the, the tables. Christoph, does that help? Yep, he says, thank you. Are there more questions? Um, can you tell me something about, so you have this um, slightly more general way of voting than just approval ballots. So does that at the other end of the spectrum, some, does it relate to judgment aggregation somehow that you can, that you maybe also complexity wise are halfway between a more classical voting setting and a full judgment aggregation setting? Have you thought about that? Uh... No, in fact, we haven't. Uh, but of course, it's an interesting direction. So. Okay, that's that's perfectly okay. Anybody else would like to ask anything? I'll give you ten seconds. Yes, Dusan. Uh, what if we bound some more restrictive parameters, say vertex cover? Can we then have unbounded uh, domain size and an FPT algorithm, I guess that's what he asked, he's asking for. Uh, I guess that the answer is no, because we have proved that the problem is W1 hard uh, for the case of unbounded uh, tree width uh, or domain. So we have to bound both of them to, to have an FPT algorithm. Can, can I make just a short comment as well? Uh, of course, Angelis. So, yes. so yeah, uh, as Yorgo said, the answer is no, because uh, essentially what we have done is that uh, there is a, an equivalence that we have established with binary CSPs. These are constraint satisfaction problems where uh, each constraint has only two variables. And uh, these characterizations and these impossibility results are derived because we, uh, we exploit some impossibility results on binary CSPs. And uh, yeah, th th that's why the answer is no. All right, thank you. Then uh, Ayumi, could you um, start sharing your slides, please, your screen? And yes, that's the one, no, yes. Okay, our next speaker is uh, Ayumi. The floor is yours. Oh, sorry. Okay, thank you. Uh, so today I would like to talk about fair ride allocation online, uh, which is a joint work with people from Japan. And also this work is supported by Toyota Motor Corporation. So uh, to begin with, I would like to introduce a very simple problem of ride sharing. So uh, here, uh, let's imagine a group of agents sharing a taxi ride. The question is how uh, do they divide the cost fairly? If agents have the same destination, the answer is very simple. We can just divide the cost equally among the agents. If, so what if uh, agents have different destinations? The answer is still very simple. We can divide the cost of each segment equally. So suppose there are three destinations and four passengers, and we divide, we can, the four passengers can divide the cost of the first blue interval equally among the four, and the three remaining agents can divide the cost of the second that interval equally among the three, and the last agent who still rides a taxi can pay the cost of the final interval. So this problem is known to be a classical airport game introduced by Little Richard and Owen in 1973, and it is known to be the very first successful application of the Shapley value. So the sequential equal division rule, which we have seen before, uh, is known to coincide with the Shapley value and therefore satisfies several nice properties. Um, it can apply to uh, other problems like the problem of sharing a facility over time for agents with different demands. And in general, it can apply to any model where agents, agents demands have linear structure. In this paper, we provide a natural extension of airport games, 
So uh, in airport camp, we have seen that there is only one taxi or there is only one facility uh, having unlimited capacity. But here we assume that there are several uh, taxis having some capacity. And our uh, question is how to group agents uh, so how to assign agents to taxis so that the resulting outcome is fair, assuming that agents assigned to the same taxi apply the sequential equal division. So one natural solution concept here is, uh, as always, MB freeness. We might want to require that no agent can reduce her course by replacing herself with another agent. Also, another uh, solution concept we can look at is stability. Uh, we, can, uh, we might want to require that no agent can reduce her course by deviating to another group. So unfortunately, in our model, MB3 outcomes may not exist, but they are still uh, very structured. So we identified three uh, important structural properties of MB freeness, monotonicity, split property, and locality. And building up the, on these, uh, we develop polynomial time algorithm for MB freeness for certain cases. But uh, we provide also we also provide MB handness for two relaxation of MB freeness. Uh, and in contrast with uh, MB freeness, we show that stable outcomes do exist in conjunction with Pareto optimality and can be efficiently computed. Uh, so for future work, um, I think there are many possible extensions of our model. For example, we can think about uh, heterogeneous facilities instead of homogeneous sound. So maybe some taxis may be more comfortable than others, or we can think about more generic, generic uh, metric space beyond line structure. Um, to conclude, although um, maybe this model is too simple to apply to the real life uh, application of light sharing, I think we provide a way to think about fairness in these applications. Uh, thank you. Uh, I, I want to finish my talk. Thank you very much. So another one perfectly on time. So please uh, unmute yourself for a round of applause. And then don't forget to mute yourself again if you are having a conversation next to your computer. Uh, then we have the first question from uh, Edith, please. You can just unmute yourself and ask. Uh, thanks, Ayumi. I, I was curious first, which stability concepts are you using in this context? Are they more like Nash stability or more like Paul stability? Um, Nash stability and um, not quite core stability, but swap stability. Um, so Nash and swap stability, and we haven't thought about core stability. Would individual stability also be relevant or would it be trivial? Um, so, they may be, they are relevant, but uh, since Nash implies uh, individual stability and Nash always exists, um, the question, uh, okay. but maybe if we think about more general uh, like structure, then maybe the problem with respect to individual stability uh, becomes interesting, I think. Yeah, but that's a good question. Thank you. Thank you. Are there more questions? Can... So I'll ask something. Uh, it's a question. No, I don't. I do not ask something because there's something much better in there by Gian Piero. Um, can you tell something about the online model when agents arrive over time? I see. So agents. Uh, so we have to assign kind of in online fashion. Uh, we have to assign each agent to each taxi on, in online fashion. So, yeah, we can think about um, extension to the online border, but I mean, I haven't thought deeply about it. And maybe we have to define uh, kind of fairness concepts tailored for uh, the online setting. So, I mean, yeah, I, I cannot, uh, there is not much I can answer now. Sorry. Uh, can, can I ask something? 
Yes, please. So we need to initially to have a polynomial algorithm for a fixed number of taxes. Do you mean an algorithm that decides whether an MD3 allocation exists or not? Exactly, and it computes an MD3 outcome if it exists. Okay, and do you have any relaxation of MD3ness that always exists, like F1 or something like this? So maybe Nash stability can be seen like um, relaxation of MB freeness because uh, basically Nash stability means that you, uh, if you deviate, then uh, there is no profitable deviation, which means that uh, if you add one more person to another group, you don't MB. So this kind of thing is, uh, I think, similar to EF1 property. Okay, so and the, and the freeness implies stability, and stability always exists. Um, actually, not. Sorry. Um, let me think. So, because I think the answer is no, but uh, I'll have to look at the paper again to see well, how to create a counterexample. Mm -hmm. uh, but here we have uh, capacity, and that might kind of. Oh, uh, okay, so it, it, it appears weaker, but it's not uh, entirely implied because of the capacity. I think so. Yes, okay. thank you. Okay. All right, thank you. I have to stop you there. Um, so there's still one question by Harris. Please answer to it in the chat because we're going to move on to the next speaker. Um, Boris, could I ask you to share your screen, please? Sure. <clears throat> let me try to do that. So, and, uh, let's... so make the right. pointer. Um, Just one more second. Yes, now I'm ready for the time. OK, you are ready. So our next speaker is Boris. Go ahead. Yeah, so I want to talk about, thank you, and I want to talk about manipulable outcomes for scoring voting rules. Well, five minutes is definitely not enough to show a movie, so I will show you a trailer and hopefully we'll try to get you interested in the movie. So let's quickly recall the setup. The definitions are very standard and usual uh, profile, positional scoring rules, and manipulability. Uh, if there will be any questions, I will ask them later. So I'll just hold this uh, slide for another five or 10 seconds. We cited coalition manipulability here, maybe that's the thing to say. Uh, and let's make an important agreement. So we will focus on asymptotic vulnerability, by which I mean we compute the limit when the number of voters tends to infinity. A very important question, VIQ, there are very important people and very important questions. And the most important question in the area, at least to my opinion, is to compute the share of manipulable outcomes, the ratio of manipulable outcomes to all possible outcomes. So how the answer is usually obtained? Well, there are two important steps. First, find a nice system of linear inequalities, which cut out the manipulable profiles, and then compute the ratio of volumes of polytopes in the famous geometric model, I think introduced by Sai. And we will focus on the first step because it's the essential step, since if you don't have the inequalities, you cannot move on to computing the volume. And let me give a brief overview of the results. There has been extensive amount of literature, so I will focus on just a few papers, which is my personal choice. So the first paper is the famous paper by Le Pelé and B, dating back to 1987, where they gave a full answer in case of the plurality voting rule and any number of candidates. Next paper I want to mention is the paper of 2007 by Pritchett and Wilson, where they give an answer for essentially any position of voting rule and three candidates. And the third paper I want to mention is our paper with Mustafa Diz uh, from this year, which by the way can be found uh, on archive, uh, there is a print period, where we give an answer for any position of voting rule, for any number of candidates, and uh, also any reasonable restriction on the coalitions. Uh, let me focus on some uh, interesting concrete observations, maybe of value um, to, to the community. So uh, the classical results for the case of three candidates, which you can see over here, uh, tell you that essentially the anti-plurality rule uh, is the most manipulable, the relative um, 
it's a close call between anti-plurality and border. The plurality was uh, the best, the least manipulable. And let's see what happens for four and five. So for a you, I'm a little bit lying here. So there is a recent paper by El Kadifi, Le Pelea, and Smaoui from 2020, where they gave an answer. They computed the number of manipulable outcomes in case of uh, the plurality rule. But the rest of this table seems to be new. We computed the approximate values with great degree of precision using the Monte Carlo method and uh, around 10 million um, trials. So our result was 87.28 on one of those trials, which is pretty close. And there are concrete estimations using uh, statistics. Um, so uh, the, the, the remaining results are new. So we also have the table for five candidates. And what you can see is this interesting observation, which I highlighted in red, and which says that antipolarity actually things switch around and antipolarity being the most subjective to manipulability in case of three candidates actually becomes the least for uh, four and five candidates. Also, all of them become really manipulable with very high degree, almost 100%. But here in this table, we also indicated other possibilities like manipulable by the, unify, the coalition unified by the second prior choice by the third prior choice by the fourth and the fifth and for plurality the last prior choice will always have uh, zero manipulability and you see that they also raise much slower like 6.52 compared to already 90 percent in the other cases so i'm not sure how well i'm doing with time so i'll quickly jump to the last slide and uh, i will tell you a few other possible applications uh, that, that, oh, all right, so that's exactly where I want to be, thank you. So uh, a few other possible applications. Well, we can compute some other indices uh, of manipulability. I think in Alice Kerov's and co-authors papers, there were plenty. And we can carry uh, out the computations for restricted coalitions and we actually did, like uh, we can take um, essentially a restriction on the proportion of the coalition or any other reasonable restriction. And also maybe we can apply this to other rules uh, like multi-stage sequential elimination scoring rules and so on. So thank you. I don't want to overdo my, my welcome. And uh, thanks for listening. And I'll be happy to answer any questions. Let me stop here. Thank you very much. Um, so round of applause, everyone. So there is already one question in the chat you can read it out yourself if you want yeah, and uh, answer it i'm not sure what you mean by exhaustive enumeration of profiles so what happens is it's a, a ratio of volumes of two polytopes one of them is a simplex so this we know how to compute in any dimension no issue here that's all possible profiles and uh, the profiles, manipulable profiles, uh, live in a certain polytope inside the simplex, which volume we need to compute. Then we use the standard Monte Carlo procedure. So it's a question of volumes, not of profiles anymore. It's a question of how to compute the volume of a polytope. And because it lives in dimension 120 or so, 119 to be precise, um, we cannot compute it precisely. So we just apply the usual Monte Carlo and I think the answer uh, was that it's not a simulation, but it's a precise calculation. Uh, so I think. there yeah. is a code on GitHub. So we actually, uh, with Mustafa, we posted all the codes on GitHub. The codes are were written on Python, just by ourselves. We didn't use any other software. And they're accessible to everybody who wants to see that. And I will be happy to explain how to actually use that. Well, a single manipulator doesn't mean anything in this case because the number of voters extends to infinity and we know that a finite subset in case of infinite number of voters has measure zero and cannot influence the election at all. Actually, this approach works for plurality rule. Uh, this, uh, the inequalities give as a particular case, the old inequalities of uh, Le Pelé and B. They also give the inequalities from that, all the other papers mentioned. And the point is that, um, well, um, Uh, that, uh, that for, for the finite case, we have a counterexample. So those inequalities do not work in finite case. Well, but for plurality rule, they do. Uh, was that another question or? 
so so yeah in, in case of infinite number of voters uh fi finally finally many people unfortunately don't mean anything they have no influence and uh, it's just a measure zero it's just a point on an interval a point on an interval Okay, are there more questions? Can I ask you a question? Yes, please. So if I understand correctly, you consider all profiles. So it's like you ask what is the probability that if you pick a random profile that you sample uniformly at random from all the profiles, then this will be manipulable. So that's that, exactly right. So, so yes. that, can you generalize the results to other distributions? Uh, that's a good question. That's one question to think about. Um, definitely. So you mean when we do not assume some IAC condition? And we yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so take some uh, Malo model, for example, or N model or whatever. Uh, that, that would be a great continuation of this work. So that's something we did not think about, but that's definitely, um, that's definitely what the last slide, uh, well, maybe because I didn't think about this and maybe someone already tried something similar and knows uh, it doesn't work. But again, it depends on the concrete restriction. So a restriction given is a mathematical problem and we can try that, we can modify the approach a little bit, but maybe it's something that's known not to be possible to be done. This, this I'm sure I'm not very, very familiar with the literature. So yeah. let me answer like that. Thank Thanks. you. Right, thank you very much uh, once more. Then uh, Nimrod, could you share your screen, please? Yeah, is it fine? It looks perfect. So our next speaker is uh, Nimrod. Go ahead. Okay. So I want to speak not about a result or a paper, but uh, basically an uh, advertisement on a website. Um, so you can go to this uh, URL maybe afterwards, this uh, pabulib.org. Um, so maybe you, you know this uh, setting of uh, participatory budgeting. So in the last years, I was interested in it and I'm still is and other people from the community are. Uh, usually it happens inside the city. So a city decides how to use the common budget in a way where they use a, a some uh, voting rule and some aggregation methods so people can vote over which project to, to fund. And uh, I think that this uh, setting is still not uh, settled from the computational social choice point of view. And for this, it helps if we have a website with a, a good uh, data source or good data sets. And this is why we built this uh, website. So if you go there, you will see something like this. Currently, there are slightly over 500 instances of participatory budgeting there. You can think about it basically like Preflib, but for participatory budgeting. Um, so, so actually, this talk maybe uh, Stajek was better to, 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 help to, to make it or to deliver it, but he's in a bachelor party, so I'm uh, filling up for him. So there are slightly over 500 uh, instances. You can download them. You can see, for example, this is from some uh, district in Varsha that they use participatory budgeting. You have the 7,000 or so voters voting over 58 project. And this is the budget and slot is that they use. And they use approval ballot, meaning that uh, each ballot is simply a subset of the project. And you can also see the the average vote length, so how many projects on average each uh, voter used. And then you can download it and uh, use it and run simulation on it. So um, the, the, the first use of this uh, website that we made is because we had uh, several aggregation methods that takes this input as the input to the aggregation method and bring uh, and output the result, which is a subset of the project that does not uh, go over the budget limit. And this is useful if you want to compare algorithms to see how they behave on the same input. So this is what we used it for, but uh, it can be used for other things. So if, if you download the data, you see, I mean, the votes, this is like the main thing, but you will also see some metadata, like uh, the demographic information about the voters and also some uh, details about the project, like the category of each project, or so there are projects about uh, recreational and, and uh, infrastructure and so on. 
And for this uh, website, we have uh, some uh, file format, which I think is quite uh, uh, natural and, and useful. And so this .pb, you see there is some uh, metadata about the instance of participatory budgeting, meaning the year and the number of projects, number of votes, the budget, what kind of uh, ballot type they used, and what uh, aggregation method they used, and the city in which it was uh, held. And then you see some uh, data about the project, and then some about the votes, which are the ballots. Um, so this is basically what I wanted to say. So if you have some data about participatory budgeting, please send it uh, anonymized, I mean, without the names of the, of the voters themselves in this uh, .pb file to either to this email or to Stanislav uh, personally or both, maybe it's better. Um, so, so he would be able to also help. And there is also in the website some uh, Python code for parsing these uh, file forms. So it makes, I hope, uh, the task of experimenting and simulating with participatory budgeting instances rather uh, simple. So this was the, the main motivation. That's it, thanks. Thank you very much. A uh, round of applause, everyone. Uh, Do we have questions? Yes, so you can read out the question from Piotr. Uh, so so you want to use the participatory budgeting instances um, for like single winner elections or approval elections or multi-winner elections, ignoring the costs. Um, okay, so maybe maybe one thing that I should have said is that uh, in participatory budgeting, usually indeed people use approval ballots, but at least in the .pb file format, you can use uh, other ballot types like ordinal and cumulative and scoring ballots. Uh, but you ask whether the distribution of ballots for participatory budgeting is reasonable to use for other settings. So I don't know. I mean, I guess that people vote with some correlation to the cost of the projects, which make it uh, maybe slightly different than the way in which people vote in uh, these results. I mean, this, this could be checked, right? So you can try to, to take this. Uh, okay, great. I knew it, right? Not uh, possible. Uh, no, no, but, but actually, this could be checked, right? So you can uh, take some, uh, some uh, approval instances for single winner elections without cost and see whether these are similar to the instances that we have in uh, public. Okay, let's go to Errol first. You can ask your question through the microphone. So you, you mentioned the several types of uh, voting, like approval, ordinal, and so on. But I think in, in some places, there is also limitation that you can vote for projects, but only if the sum of course is uh, at most the budget. So it's not exactly like approval voting. How do you represent this in, in, in the database? Yeah, that's true. So you refer to NAPSAC voting. Um, in terms of the file format, this is simply approval ballot. Uh, whether you want to, to check whether all ballots satisfy the NAPSA constraint, this you can you can do. But in terms of the file format, this is the same. Well, what I say is that if, if you have this limitation, the interpretation of the data is different because it's not that uh, this is all they want. They maybe they want more, but they were not allowed to, to express this. So yeah, 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 this is true. So, so is there an information in the data whether there was such a limitation in the... Yeah, so, so, yeah, so this is written, in, I mean, this should be written in the meta, meta section in the file. Okay. Uh, you say that the exact ballot type was NAPSAC voting or let's say five approval or whatever. Okay. Then you can still, if you want to add to something to Paolo's question in the chat, you can... Ah, so I think Piotr answered for me. So I guess that Piotr answered well. <laughs> there are too many acronyms in Piotr's answer, so if you can explain it for me, thank you. ILP is integer linear programming, PB is participatory budgeting. <laughs> That's it. 
No, no, but I guess, I mean, you can use it to, yeah, so to evaluate running time or to evaluate any other property that you want from some aggregation method. I mean, not only aggregation method, but uh, this is what uh, maybe is the core of, uh, of what we do. Can I ask one uh, final question? So do, I don't know whether you were also involved in actually getting these data sets. So any experience that you can share about how to talk to the municipality so that they actually give you the data? So we've yeah, been trying for half a year and they say, yes, we would really like to do this, but uh, somehow it may be next week. And I think they're worried about some privacy issue. I'm not sure what the issue yeah, is. Yeah, of course, of course. Yeah, so this is an excellent question. So from my own personal uh, experience, so I tried with several municipalities and exactly what you described happened to me. So, so I couldn't get uh, much, maybe one or two. Um, but what uh, Stanislav did, and he told me that there is a kind of a law in Poland that uh, require the city heads to to have the to to distribute the data anonymized, but somehow in the uh, like a public the information the or something like this. Yeah, in yeah, some yeah. countries, they have these laws. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So there is some law, and I mean, and, and it said that uh, still some cities are not very helpful initially, but then when you show them the law, then they give it. The data. <laughs> This helps. Yes, I think what can help is if, if you volunteer to to do the, this task for the municipality, then you then you have the data. Yeah. I mean, sorry, can you say it again? I couldn't yeah. understand. If if you volunteer to program the system for them and run all, all this system for them for free, then you also get the data. Yeah, true. Yeah, and, and also I know that uh, Stanislav uh, had to. I mean, take the data and fiddle it around and make it in our own format, of course. But, uh, mm. but still, I mean, you could get some data. All right. Um, thank you very much. Then this is um, the end of the first half. Let me uh, stop the recording. All right. Welcome back. Um, Paul, you can share your slides. That should do it. Yeah. That very well does it. So our next speaker is Paul. Please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, you can hear me, me. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for having me uh, to present this work uh, on a hotling downs framework for party nomination, um, which is joint work with uh, Greg Lisowski, Ramanujan Shiraram, and Paolo Torini, who is also in the seminar. And now I must. Um, well, primary elections, as uh, most of you will know, um, is a two tiered uh, election system where parties first uh, nominate a candidate and then the candidates um, <coughs> face off in a nationwide election. Uh, this is a system that they also have in the United States. Um, and last year there were also primary elections or 2019. And um, as you may remember, um, the uh, Democrats had the following problem, uh, taking it for granted that um, Donald Trump would be the uh, Republican candidate. They thought, well, when we nominate a left-leaning candidate like Elizabeth Warren, we might lose the election because we're not attracting enough um, uh, voters. By uh, nominating Joe Biden, this was averted. Of course, um, the Republicans could perhaps uh, chosen them more arguably more uh, left-leaning candidate like uh, Bill Weld, um, and then still have won the election. But what this shows is that there is an, a strategic issue um, in how to uh, select your uh, nominee as a party. And this is what we want to study using pure Nash equilibrium uh, as a solution concept. Uh, well, this is our model. So parties are, uh, in, uh, well, we have this, uh, we have a line which is a discrete line, and parties are subsets of uh, points on this line. They are all indicated by circles. They are the candidates. Um, full bullets uh, are the chosen candidates, and the electorate is depicted on the bottom. Um, voters are attracted to the party whose nominee is closest, and that's indicated by the colored boxes. And parties who are players want to attract as many voters as possible. Okay, so we considered uh, both the two-party case and the multi-party case, 
uh, in the two-party case, uh, we immediately found um, that um, Nash equilibria are not uh, guaranteed to exist as this simple uh, matching penny type uh, are, um, example shows where one party uh, tries to be as close to the other party as nominee wise and the other wants to exactly the opposite. In other settings, Nash equilibria are guaranteed to exist. So this raised the question, well, uh, how hard is it to compute <clears throat> whether a Nash equilibrium exists in this setting? And it turned out that it can be done in linear time. Um, the main idea is that if you want to know of two uh, candidates, uh, whether they're in mutual best response, you only have to show in the immediate neighborhood of, uh, the, uh, of the candidate. So for the red candidate, the best response for the blue candidate will be only be in at most three, uh, the three surrounding uh, blue candidates, and for the blue candidates, it will be that most three candidates there, and you can check whether they're mutual response. Then uh, the second thing is that um, um, we know that if there's a Nash equilibrium, there's also an equilibrium where one of the nominees is very close to the median outcome, which are indicated here by the uh, green circles. And this uh, shrinks the search space uh, dramatically and we can solve the problem in uh, linear time. In a multi-party case, we see a similar picture. So um, Nash equilibrium is not guaranteed to exist, not even in some special cases, um, but in some, if you restrict it far enough, it is. Again, this raised uh, a question, uh, how hard it is to compute whether uh, a Nash equilibrium exists. Uh, this turned out to be NP complete, so a stark difference with the two par uh, party uh, case. And we showed this by a reduction from three set. Um, where the most interesting, uh, interesting thing presumably was that uh, we used, uh, we needed a potential argument uh, to show that uh, a Nash equilibrium did exist in the case that the uh, uh, CNF is satisfiable. So uh, we were then faced in the construction with a situation where all the parties are mostly in, are only interested in sharing a position with as few other parties as possible. Um, and then you can show that you have kind of congestion type of argument that uh, if there's a profitable uh, deviation, then potential, which is uh, up here, which is the lexicographic ordering of the number of parties on a certain position increases. Um, so we also have a number of uh, directions for future research. Um, so we saw that um, uh, if we, uh, if the, um, the number of parties is uh, bounded and it's uh, polynomial time. Uh, but uh, in few of the uh, intractability results, we also want to look at parameterized complexity. Uh, other solution concept like Nash, uh, then Nash equilibrium would be interesting. Um, what would happen um, if we can nominate several candidates instead of only one? And perhaps the most interesting question is, um, how should a party select a nominee if it's not only interested in attracting as many voters as possible, but all to win an election, which usually takes place under a certain voting rule. For a two-player case, uh, that would be a uh, majority rule. And if you look at our uh, matching pennies example that I've shown before, you can see that the blue party always has a majority, but still the, the, uh, the game doesn't have a Nash equilibrium. So um, in that case, uh, if it is only interested in uh, winning the election, it didn't, uh, wouldn't like to deviate in any case, no matter what nominee the Red Party chooses. chooses. So uh, that's basically my present, uh, presentation and many thanks for your attention. Thank you very much. Round of applause, everyone. Unmute yourselves. There's a question in the chat, not marked as such, but I believe it is a question by Jörg. Um, does it make sense to look at single peak electorates in this setting, he's asking. Uh, 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 presumably, yes, uh, I guess so. Um, uh, we haven't looked into that. Um, you have many more questions, uh, I, I just answer some uh, where you know the it answer. Defi definitely uh, makes sense, of course, but I can't, uh, cannot uh, see the uh, consequences of uh, what 
uh, can this face a strategic candidacy game? Um, well, it clearly has um, um, has connections with strategic candidacy. Um, but here, of course, we also have the party, so you're restricted to the party itself. Um, it would be interesting, of course, to see if parties can gain by not having certain uh, uh, certain candidates available at all. Um, so not uh, having them uh, run in the primary elections. Could you estimate the number of promos where? Uh, no, I have no idea about the number of uh, profiles where Nash actually exists. Sorry. Uh, Paolo, would you have an idea? No, he's not there. Um, no idea, I wrote in the chat. Okay, uh, blue, blue political metric. Um, yes, um, well, our setting is closely related to other settings like foreign oil games and also facility location. Um, there, there have also been settings with uh, on trees and on uh, planes and Euclidean spaces. Um, so uh, one of the features of our work was actually that's a discrete line where there are very few restrictions uh, where the uh, party can have their candidates. Um, oh, wait. Uh, thank you, Paolo, for uh, question. The case when all the candidates of party from interval reasonable attractable subclass. Um, in the two-party case, um, that was actually also one of my slides, then a Nash equilibrium is uh, guaranteed to exist. So we can solve that in uh, constant time. Um, uh, boop, boop, boop. The instance based on three set did not appear to be an instance of this kind. Mm. I don't quite understand the last remark, frankly. Uh, this is what if we measure the photo satisfaction in average? Um, I still I have to defer that to future research as well, frankly. You're really over. <laughs> I'm overwhelmed by questions. It's, I never had it before. That's very nice. Um, Take one more, and yeah. then we're going to stop. Okay. Uh, what if we measure satisfaction in average? Um, yeah, we didn't look at um, uh, boop, boop, uh, at uh, photo satisfaction at all. Okay. Uh, boop, 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 boom. Boop, boop, boop. I meant that the heart did not seem to be of the interval kind. Okay, okay, that was a potential direction. Okay, I don't see any questions anymore. Um, yeah, if not, you will work through them uh, in the chat in the coming minutes while we're listening to the next speaker. Thank you very much. Uh, Kuna, you can, you can share your screen. Yeah, that looks good. Our next speaker is uh, Puna. Go ahead. The five W's of fairness in multi-winner elections. Fairness. Fairness is not a new term and has been around since centuries. However, fairness in computer science is relatively new and has received a particular attention recently. For instance, there is a rise, 38% rise in the number of papers that contain the word fair or fairness in their titles. And a conference was established that was dedicated in part to fairness. Similarly, our community is also not immune to this in vogue tr trend. Uh, in this talk, I will talk about fairness in the context of multi winner elections. Uh, just a reminder, in multi-winner elections, the aim is to select a committee we are, where we are, when we are given a set of candidates, a set of voters, a complete ordered preferences of voters over candidates, and some committee selection rule. Uh, I should note here that the, this marriage of fairness and multi-winner elections is not a new one, and uh, researchers have been using fairness in varying contexts in the study of multi-winner elections. Uh, for instance, diversity of candidates, where we say that we want male candidates and female candidates in the committee is one uh, context of fairness. On the other hand, representation of voters, wherein we would want to guarantee the states uh, some representatives in the committee is another notion of fairness. 
and it is very important to note here that these are two very different contexts of fairness within the same domain and such context specific use of the term fairness may narrate an incomplete story diversity of candidates can lead to unfairness to voters or representation of voters can lead to unfairness to uh, candidates in either case unfairness to voters or unfairness to uh, candidates uh, 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 such context specific uh, uses of the word uh, fairness can do more harm than good hence we take seek refuge under the 5 w's which have been used extensively by researchers and journalists to ensure completeness of their story in our context specifically uh, we seek to answer who is the fairness for how many candidates to elect what candidates to elect when is the model tractable and feasible because obviously we are going to introduce a lot many constraints so we want to ensure that the models that we develop are real world usable where can such models be used and most importantly why do we need this model in today's talk i'll just focus on the first answering the first question who is the fairness for so there are two actors of an election namely the candidates and the voters in our case candidates are divided into two groups males and females and voters are divided into predefined populations of uh, california and illinois uh, we have computed voter scores of the candidates over here depending on the uh, rankings given by the voters and the aim is to select a committee of size 2 which will be a k border committee uh, and uh, we also uh, compute the uh, winning committees for each population so we can see that if california had run an election for itself c1 and c2 would have been the winner and for illinois c4 and c2 had a, would have been the winner an optimal committee winning committee in this case would consist of c1 and c2 however we know that we can see that it contains only males and diversity is missing in this scenario so we add diversity constraints wherein we would want at least one male and at least one female in the committee so the diverse committee would look like something like this where in c1 and c3 are are winners and they uh, meet the diversity requirements however there is no representation for illinois uh, we can see that earlier uh, illinois had a representative in the committee but with the introduction of diversity constraints illinois lost its representative from the committee so we would want to have diversity constraints and representation constraints which would lead to a diverse and a representative committee and we call this a dire committee so in summary it's important that all actors of a system are considered uh, we move towards completing the story of fairness in elections by getting rescued uh, by the 5 w's and through a series of investigations we are hoping to move towards a fairer multiwinner election thank you thank you very much uh, round of applause everyone okay do we have any questions uh, does the dire committee always exist so if we allow arbitrary constraints to be set then probably the dire committee won't exist but through extensive uh, simulations on synthetic data set wherein we kind of put some sort of constraints on the uh, sizes that uh, on the number of candidates that are selected from each candidate group we show that uh, dire committees would exist on at least 90% of the time so the feasibility studies done if uh the constraints are set in accordance with some pre decided rules okay does this answer your question errol so, so you said that in simulations it exists but uh, you don't have a theoretic proof it in the pathological cases it might not exist yes uh, uh, in the worst case scenario it won't exist because we can arbitrarily set the constraints such that there is no satisfiable instance or a feasible instance Uh, or a committee that's possible okay there's another question in the chat 
there's a lot of writing on fairness in both behavioral psychology and moral psychology. Can you relate these notions to discussion from these fields? So unfortunately, I'm not too aware of the fairness from the uh, side of psychology, but there's a lot of discussion of fairness in terms of the use of AI and machine learning, wherein uh, historical biases are propagated by these systems. So here through our study, what we are trying to show is that few of these existing uh, scoring rules are designed, which unfortunately propagates uh, historical biases in terms of the candidates that are selected and in terms of the representation that the smaller uh, what voter population get. Uh, I have a question thanks. from Eric. Uh, what about dire committee and the existence of a Condorcet committee? So we have not specifically looked at con the relationship between these two. And actually that's a good question. And I would definitely investigate uh, this. Um, it's un unfortunately, sorry, I don't have anything to say on this right now, but thank you. That's a, that's a good question. Right, thank you very much. And Chin Mai, could you share your screen, please? All right, I think I'm ready to start. Yeah, uh, looks good. So our next speaker is Chin Mai. Please go ahead. Hi, my name is Chin Mai Sonar. I'm from University of California, Santa Barbara. I'm a second year PhD student. Uh, I'll present a recent work on equitable division of a path. This is a joint work with Nildara Mishra, Rohit Vesh, and P.R. Vaidyanathan. Here, uh, we assume rather than a basic fair division problem where you do not have any further constraint on the goods, we assume geometric uh, constraints over the goods. And these geometric constraints uh, pose some constraints on the set of permissible feasible allocations. Uh, to motivate the model more, I'll give an example. Uh, consider the fair allocation problem when we want to divide, fairly divide the supercomputer access time. We have three agents, Alice, Bob, and Charlie. Consider the allocation on this screen. Here, Alice has to go, um, go back and forth uh, from the supercomputer access. This might be troublesome in, troublesome in two ways. Uh, Alice might not be able to finish her computation intensive task in one go. And if Alice has to go physically somewhere, then this might be of great inconvenience. Uh, consider this allocation where all three agents get connected bundles and each agent gets roughly one third of the total time to the supercomputer. This is definitely more attractive and hence this uh, motivates the needs to study connected fair allocations. To be more formal, here is our model. Uh, we represent goods as a vertices on a graph. The edges of the graph uh, encode the connectivity constraints. In this work, we particularly consider path graphs. Next, we have the agents, which have additive cardinal preferences over the set of goods. We seek for connected allocations. Here is one example of connected allocation. In this allocation, Bob's utility is eight, which is just the summation of individual, uti individual utilities of its goods. We seek for fair, fair connected allocations. In terms of fairness notions, envy freeness has been widely studied. It means that each agent values its own bundle at least as much as uh, any other agent's bundle. Here is an example of envy free allocation. NV free allocations do not always exist for indivisible goods, hence the uh, notion of NV freeness up to one good. Note that here we see the world through the eyes of one particular agent, that is, we compare UI of AI with UI of AJ. Uh, EF1 allocations are known to exist, always exist for at most four agents. A nice open problem here is to study the existence and computation of these allocations beyond four agents. In this work, we particularly focus on the notion of equitability, which means that each agent derives equal utility from their bundles in the given allocation. Here is an example of equitable allocation where each agent derives utility of three. Again, EQ, equitable allocations do not always exist, hence the relaxed notion of equitability up to one good. Notice the difference that in equitability, we see the we compare the utilities of individual agents through their own perspectives. So UI of AI is compared to UJ of AJ. Uh, this leads us uh, to the question of does connected fair, uh, connected equitable allocations always exist on a path? We answer this question positively and this brings me to the main result. We show that a connected complete EQR allocation of a path can be computed in polynomial time. 
Our algorithm also computes such, al such an allocation consistent with any given left to right orderings of the agent. That is, uh, if the agents are standing in a line, let's say from left to right, and uh, assume the set of bundles uh, on a path from left to right, then the leftmost agent gets the first bundle on the left. The second agent from the left will get the second bundle and so on. This is already in stark contrast with NVEF1, where even the existence is not known and in equitability, we have the existence for all the orderings of the agents. Uh, our algorithm also gives egalitarian optimal allocation, which means that it maximizes the minimum utility received under uh, this allocation. And our algorithm extends for the case when mo of monotonic valuations, that is you do not need additivity and it uh, extends to the case of chores. We become greedy and ask if EQ1 and efficient allocations exist. In particular, we ask if EQ1 and T, uh, Pareto optimal allocations exist. A one-line definition of Pareto optimality would be an allocation is Pareto optimal if re any redistribution of goods making an agent better off makes at least one agent worse off. With simple examples, we observe that EQ1 and TO allocations do not always exist. Here is one such example. Next, we see if the existence can be checked uh, efficiently. We answer this question, uh, we show that this problem is NP complete. A reduction, uh, a hardness reduction also holds on sparse instances, meaning that each agent only values constant number of goods and each good is valued by only by constant number of agents. This strengthens the known uh, hardness result for EF1 and Pareto optimal allocations uh, for sparse instances. Uh, moving on to the open problems. It is natural to ask what happens on mo a more general class of graphs. So all the questions we study on the path can be studied on the general graphs. Another interesting direction for research is to consider the mixed case when goods and chores both are present at the same time. In this case, uh, here is an example of valuation matrix which would contain both positive and negative valuation at the same time. Uh, that's the conclusion of my talk, thank you. Thank you very much. Let's unmute ourselves and uh, clap a little bit. We have some questions. Yes, Sanjukta, you can unmute yourself and ask. Uh, hi. So your definition of EQ1, I just wanted to ask, in the example you gave, when you remove the item, the remaining allocation, the remaining allocation was still connected. So do you need that in the definition? Uh, no, we do not need that in our definition. You can remove arbitrary good and the remaining allocation need not be connected. I see, thanks. Are there more questions? I'll just wait a few seconds. So, so your results are for a monotone valuations, but not for a additive valuations where some where that are not monotone, right? Uh, right, that's true. We need monotonicity for our results. Hmm. Thank you for the question. Okay, then I think in the interest of time, we're going to move on. Thank you very much once more. Then I would like to ask Farouk to share the slides. We didn't have a chance to practice at the beginning, but I see it seems to be working almost. Okay, hello everyone. No, it's not working yet. We don't see your slides. But now we can see you. Now we see the slides. Excellent. Okay. So Hello, then our is... final speaker is about to talk. Yes. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, the topic of my presentation is distributing the European Union greenhouse gas emission for the period of 2021 to 2030. After signing the Paris Agreement in 2015, uh, in order to uh, fight with uh, global warming and uh, solve the problem of climate change, European Union set three targets, 20% reduction in greenhouse gas emission in 2020 compared with 19, 40% reduction in 2030, 80% to 95% in 2050. This figure shows that, okay, they started a decreasing trend. Even in 2017, they succeeded to decrease 21 
0.7% and overachieved the target of 2020. But please look at these two different passes in uh, green and yellow colors. They, these passes are actually countries uh, emission projections into different scenarios for the years after 2020. As you can see, they cannot keep themselves on the pathway of the Paris Agreement. They will deviate it. Please look at this number. This is our emission budget. If you want to be committed to the Paris Agreement, what projections into different scenarios are larger than? So this is a problem. For solving this problem, some uh, studies uh, propose that we divide emission budgets among countries. Therefore, their portion is their limitation. They cannot emit more than this. In fact, they are not allowed to uh, emit more than this. But the problem is, the main question is, how can we divide this? Okay. In 2016, one uh, paper, one uh, study proposed that we consider this situation as a bankruptcy problem or claims problems, and they implemented claims problem for uh, one a period for different uh, countries, and I collaborated with these papers. What is claims problems? Claims problems uh, divide the scarce resource among the different agents when the total of agents' claims exceed the available resource. Here we define the 27 European member states and UK as our agents, their projections that have to, they have to report, it, uh, report them as a claims, and also uh, that emission budget uh, that uh, allow us to follow the Paris Agreement is our research or endowment. And we use the six well-known division rules to divide our emission budget, proportional constraint, equal award, equal losses, time with adjusted proportional and alpha minimal. Uh, we use some principles to examine the characteristic of these rules. You can see here that proportional, CEA, and Talmud uh, satisfy most of the rules more uh, that they are more optimal. Here you can see the um, emission allocation for the whole period of 2020. Look at, for example, that CEA. It's very appropriate for country with uh, smaller projections. But for example, CEL is not fair for them. They, uh, Malta or Cyprus with smallest projection receive nothing. Therefore, just by this amount, we cannot decide to propose one rule or some of them as a solution. We need more criteria for this reason. We study them from equity and a stability point of view by using Gini index and coefficient of variation. Also, we propose that to uh, divide uh, annual emission budget, the amount countries based on annual their annual projection. Here, in our worst scenario, we have claims problems. Therefore, uh, we divided the, our emission budget. Again, we implemented our division rules. But how? Uh, a bit in a, a bit dynamic way. For example, in Malta, Malta's claims in 2021 is 2.48. Okay, and uh, uh, if we implement, for example, proportional rule, we give them we give Malta 2.45 and 0.0. .0 uh, three is unsatisfied part of Malta's claim. We added this claim to the uh, claim of the next year and then divide the emission budget of the next year based on this emission budget. And uh, as you can see, we have some differences in results. For example, in CEM, now Malta or, Cy or Cyprus received something. Uh, as a conclusion, uh, we propose that if we just consider the allocation measures, we can see that CEA or alpha minimal can be our best uh, solution for solving climate change problem in the European Union. But by considering the principles, Talmud is the best after that CEA and proportional. Or by considering our equity and stability point of view, we can say that CEA is the most equitable and stable result, uh, sorry, rules. And after that, proportional rule and uh, alpha minimal. Okay, thank you so much. I don't know about my time. Perfectly on time. So thank you very much. Are there any questions? I'll just... Can yes. you make the countries on the different rules? Oh, of course. You have different proposals, but they have, you have a, in the European Union, you have different schemes. You need to have some, uh, you have some um, uh, voting rules. You need to, I think, if I remember, 
two thirds of the country to take a decision with 50% of the population, something like that. If you vote on the different proposal, what, what would be the, the result of the, of the process? Do you, I'm, I'm, am I clear? No, not, may, not maybe. You have several proposals for the reduction, for the, for the repartition of the emission, but in the European country may vote on them depending on their interest. But when you apply the voting scheme of the European Union on this proposal, what would happen? Uh, sorry, I couldn't understand your question correctly because okay. I don't have your voice clearly. Sorry, I cannot hear you clearly. Okay. So, sorry. Move, move on. Okay. So the question is your work actually used by the EU? No. Before uh, previous studies uh, implemented it for different groups, different uh, uh, countries in the global level. Okay, I think the European Union on the different rules using this voting. Oh, sorry, I couldn't understand your question as well. Can you? Hmm. Yes, why not? I think any, uh, in any situation that the resource is not enough, we can use claims problem. Okay, are there more questions? I'll wait a few more seconds. Um, just raise your hand if you want to say something that would be easier for me to notice. And if not, then thank you very much once more also for this last talk. I think it was very nice to see not so many different uh, things are happening. Uh, so this is basically the end uh, of the session, a couple of announcements. Um, and I'm gonna ask Edith first to tell us what's gonna happen in two weeks time. She's around still. Uh, yes, I'm around. Just give me a second to look up the exact titles. Okay, so we'll have our seminar two weeks from now. So this will mark, we will be marking the first anniversary of the ComSec seminar series, right? And there will be some special celebration, which details of which I'm not, I'm not going to reveal, but do please show up in a in two weeks to celebrate with us. Right? It's incredible that we've been, we've been already doing that for a year. I suppose it's a reminder that social distancing has been continuing for so long, right? So in that sense, it's not good news, but in other sense, right? So we are today currently at 84 people. A bit early, we were at over hundred people. So at least this seminar is doing well. Okay, and so that's one reason to attend. So another reason is that we have two exciting speakers next week. So one is Fokion Kalaitis, so the other one is Judy Goldsmith. So both speakers are based in the United States. So we'll be, so we'll start one hour later than usual to accommodate that. So it will still be fairly early morning for Fokion, who is in California, right? But 10 a.m. in New York time, so 4 p.m. Paris, one hour, one hour later than usual. So Fokion will talk about semantics and complexity of queries on election databases. And Judy will talk about opinion diffusion risk to heterogeneous agents and dynamic network. So looking forward to having you there next week. Thank you. I'm looking forward to it as well. I'm just going to stop the recording and then tell you the last thing.